So without further ado, please help me welcome Amy Ruttenberg to the stage. Hi all, thanks for having me. So just so that I know, by a show of hands, how many of you have covered World War I in any way, shape, or form in class? OK, good, most of you. So hopefully this is mostly review. I actually want to start with my family, the Rutenberg family here, taken about 1927. Uh, this guy right here is my grandfather, Mort. This is my great-grandfather, Mo. And this is my great-grandmother, Rose. And I bring them up because they are the Rutenberg family. Rutenberg's a German name. It roughly translates to Red Mountain. And as family lore has it, Rose and Mo there sat down at one point and seriously considered changing the family name from Rutenberg to Redmont. Um, they ultimately decided not to. But this has been sort of one of those mind games that people in my family have played. What would have happened if I were Amy Redmont instead of Amy Rutenberg? Would I be somebody different? Right? Why would somebody actually sit down at the kitchen table or somewhere else and contemplate changing their name? And the answer, in my family's case, and in a whole lot of other families' cases, is World War I. And so I just wanted to start there to give you a sense. So I'm going to run through the causes of the war in Europe. Hopefully you have covered them. Um, your teachers can relate that 25 minutes to cover why World War I <laughs> is kind of an absurd idea, but going to try. So reason number one uh, is imperialism. By 1913, most of the territories of the world had been divided up, and you can sort of get a sense of how they'd been divided up based on this map. But even though they're you know, not fighting over giant chunks of land, everyone, all of the great powers of Europe, are still in competition with each other. They're looking for greater territorial, greater political, greater economic resources, and there are all kinds of like border skirmishes around the world and also a lot of posturing back in Europe. There was a really strong belief that if your empire wasn't growing, you were losing, you were becoming weaker, that there's the amount of power in the world is completely finite. And so if someone gets more power, it automatically means that someone else has to have less power. And so your job as a great power European nation, don't lose power. So they, to keep from falling behind, the great powers of the world start making alliances with each other. These are, uh, this was the best map I could find. It shows Italy on the side after 1915. Italy had allied itself in the beginning with Germany, Austria, Hungary, and the Ottoman Empire. And then the other side lined up pretty much as France, England, and Russia. Um, and there are a whole series of alliances that, that have to do with that. Cause number two of World War I is nationalism. As you've probably learned, nationalism is a feeling of fierce pride in your country. But it goes beyond patriotism. It's a belief that your country is not only the best, but that everything your country does ought to make your country more powerful. Or if you don't have a country, right, it encompasses the idea that you and people like you ought to be independent, ought to have your own country. This shows up in World War I with Serbia. Serbia was part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, but there were ethnic Serbs in other places. The Serbs themselves believed that they should have their own sort of greater Serbia separate and apart from Austria-Hungary. That idea makes the great powers very nervous, right? They're all colonial powers. They want to hang on to what they've got, but the people who are part of that empire maybe don't want to be there, right? So major powers are nervous as a result of that. And then militarism. Militarism is the idea that all, that military operations are a legitimate way of, it's a legitimate tool of foreign relations, either through the threat of war or through war itself. And it goes beyond spending, although to be clear, military spending increased by 50% in Europe in all of the great powers between 1908 and 1913. So there's massive money being poured into the building of, of uh, you know, tanks to some extent. They're just starting to figure out what these are, but into, into artillery weapons, particularly small arms. They spend less on ammunition for some reason, but whatever. Um, and it goes beyond spending, though. It's about shifting the entire social structure and economic structure of the country itself. In Germany, for example, all horses were designated part of the reserve. 
right? Because at the time, you're still using horses to move things from point A to point B. So if you mobilize the military, you need horses. So you put all the horses that are owned by people into the military reserve. They can be called up, just like soldiers can, right? I chose this particular picture because this is down in Rhodesia, which is a British holding. <coughs> And so the point here is that it becomes a world war. When you carry over that militarism into the colonies too, then you get people who have become involved from places not just in Europe. Um, and so by 1914, the European nations were one, vying for supremacy, two, allied against and with one another, and three, really well armed. So you put those pieces together and when Archduke Franz Ferdinand of the Austro-Hungarian Empire and his wife Sophie are assassinated by a Serbian nationalist, it's enough to kick off the war, right? People are upset, the alliances sort of shift into place, and so one thing leads to another, and you have a cascade of countries declaring war on each other. The U.S., however, in 1914, when the war breaks out, was really interested in staying neutral. To be frank, World War I was a mess. There were plenty of pictures of terrible things happening in the trenches that I could put up here, but I decided rats would be a good way to go because, one, it's a little less disturbing, and two, it's gross. You know, the terrier here caught all these giant rats in the trenches. In other words, Americans really were engaged in letting the Europeans fight it out amongst themselves. And then, of course, you have the question of what side is the U.S. going to be on? It wasn't <laughs> obvious that it would be the Allied side, right? If you look at the American population in 1914, almost 11 million Americans had at least one parent, or perhaps themselves, were from Germany, Austria, Hungary, or Italy, okay? Just over 10 million Americans had one parent from England, France, or Russia. So in other words, there are more Americans who are, trace their immediate ancestry back to the other side than to the Allied side. And individual alliances aren't simple. Irish Americans, for example, right? They don't like the British because the British had basically encompassed them, had taken them over. Ireland wants independence, so Ireland's not too fond of England. So what side are the Irish going to be on in America? So it makes sense to maintain neutrality. However, neutrality was something that was super difficult to hang on to, right? So trade is one of those things that comes up. By the usual laws of war, right, the way that it had been done for centuries, right, a belligerent nation can trade with a neutral nation, and neutral nations can trade with all the belligerents in a war. So in theory, the U.S. feels like, hey, our ships can go and our stuff can go on German ships to Germany, English ships to England, French ships to France, and we can bring our own U.S. ships to wherever, and we can carry whatever we want because, hey, we're neutral. Right? However, that doesn't work super well with the advent of submarine warfare. By the old laws of war, right, submarine, uh, a ship that was going to stop another ship and board it, you would say, hey, you know, I'm the German ship, I'm stopping you, English ship, all the Americans, get off. I'm about to sink this ship. Right? But the whole point of submarine warfare is that it's secret. The submarine doesn't surface and say, hey, we're here right? They shoot their torpedoes from under the water, and the whole point is that it's secret. So that doesn't work. And so although the Germans, who are the ones using the submarines, the U-boats, try to do the things that everyone had done in the past, like run advertisements in the newspapers saying, hey, Americans, stay off British ships, who's going to listen? Right? Pretty much nobody. So when a British passenger liner called the Lusitania, which I assume you've heard of, was sunk by a German U-boat, and it kills 128 Americans, including 37 women and 21 children, of the about 1,200 people that died, it sent an uproar, it sent up a furor. The Germans were like, we warned you, and besides, that ship is not, in fact, so neutral. Um, or it's not, it's not just a passenger liner, it's not just a cruise ship, it's not just a love boat. As it turns out, it was carrying thousands of cases of small arms. So it was carrying weaponry to one side, and the Germans were on the other side, and they said, eh, sink, right? But it was a moment when a lot of Americans started demanding war. This is 1915. The U.S. does not enter the war in 1915. 
All right. President Woodrow Wilson of the U.S. issues a series of statements, they're known as the Lusitania Statements, demanding the stop of submarine warfare. And there's a whole series of diplomatic incidents that happen between 1915 and 1916, and eventually the Germans back down. In 1916, they say, all right, we're going to stop our unrestricted submarine warfare. Wilson is re-elected in 1916 as the president who kept us out of war. But Neutrality remains really difficult. The British had cut the transatlantic cables that carried news under the Atlantic Ocean to the United States. So most of the news that's coming into the US is coming in through Britain. It's coming in through allied sources, okay? Including a whole bunch of propaganda. So you end up seeing, and you'll hear about this, I would assume in a couple of moments, about the horrors of the Germans in Belgium, right? Here are some propaganda, these are British, right? But the idea here is that the Germans are destroying Belgium, they're killing women and children, it's terrible, and this is the news that's filtering back into the United States. There's also the part where most Americans do speak English, right? And so there's, and, and a lot of Americans do trace their sort of heritage back to the Mayflower and Jamestown and, and you know, this sort of, British even legal tradition and, and where does the Constitution come from and this idea of a Bill of Rights and, and stuff like that. It's coming, people think, you know, from England. So you add that to the Zimmerman telegram and things just sort of begin to snowball on top of each other. So the Zimmerman telegram, it's one of these crazy sort of diplomatic things that happens. So. Arthur Zimmerman is the German foreign secretary, and he sends a telegram to Mexico saying, look, we are about to resume our unrestricted submarine warfare. The Americans, not going to like it very much. We're hoping they stay neutral, but they may not. So if they don't, how would you, Mexico, like to declare war on the United States? That would be a great idea, because Mexico, you can slow down the Americans from joining our war. That will allow us, the Germans, to go ahead and win this war in Europe. And since you will have been allied with us, you can get back New Mexico, Arizona, and Texas, which got taken from Mexico, well, not quite 100 years, but many years earlier, right? This sounds great, doesn't it, Mexico? Mexico kind of blew it off. But the British intercepted this cable. They decoded it, and then eventually they held on to it for a little while. They waited until that unrestricted submarine warfare had started up again, and the Americans were already beginning to be upset, and then the British gave it to the Americans. At which point, combined with a series of sinkings of American merchant ships, the US Wilson went to Congress and said, look, I think it's time for a declaration of war. Right? And so he goes on April 2nd to Congress. The House, I think, passes on the 4th, and the Senate passes on the April 6th, yesterday, 100th anniversary, right? Why we're all here. The thing is, and just a brief overview of American involvement American involvement in the war itself was fairly limited. War is declared in April 1917. A few American soldiers are sent over by summer, but in general, the American military is small and weak in 1917. It's got to grow, and it's got to grow quickly. So it's not until spring 1918 that U.S. troops arrive in Europe in any kind of number to do anything. And in November 1918, armistice is declared. So though Americans are involved in some very important battles, although a lot of Americans do perish in, that, in those battles, in terms of actual length of service, this war is short for the US. But the US does help break the stalemate on the Western Front, right? They've been bogged down in these trenches for years. Um, millions of people are dying. Um, at the Battle of the Somme in 1916, 1.5 million people died over a seven-mile stretch of land. Right? So the scale of it is just mind-blowing. And it's the fact that the Americans are entering with their men, with their manpower, with their materials, with their sort of fresh eyes, with their ability. You know, it's, it's not so much what the Americans did in battle that won the war. It was the threat that there would be more Americans coming that sort of ended, began the process of ending the war.
But the thing is, is that Americans in 1916 had elected a president saying, I'm going to keep you out of war. And then it's 1917, and that president says, hey, let's go to war. How do you mobilize the people to do that? What does it do? How do you get most, the majority of Americans to get behind this war? The answer, truthfully, propaganda, right? You have to sell the war, particularly to those who maybe have family in now the enemy countries, right? So the Committee for Public Information is created. It's run by a guy named George Creel. And he and Wilson basically settle on this idea that we are going to sell the war as a war of idealism. It's a war to end all wars. It's a war for democracy to bring you know, freedom and liberty to the people of Europe. And to, it, it'll be an ideological, idealistic war. And that's this particular propaganda poster here, right? This idea that liberty shall not perish from the earth by liberty bonds. And there are all different kinds of ways that the CPI gets involved in trying to sell this war. Right. Here's a propaganda poster. Who is this specifically talking to? Anybody? Immigrants. immigrants, exactly, right? The United States is and was a nation of immigrants. You have over 20 million people who trace at least one parent back to a European nation. So the idea here is that yeah, they came here for a reason. Let's think about what that reason is and let's support the United States. And for the very most part, I mean, vast majorities of people, regardless of where they came from, they got on board. But the problem is, is that the CPI also had a tendency to go a little too far. Okay, Germans are demonized. Um, and if German Americans were not able to show their particular loyalty to the United States in the ways that some extra specially patriotic people wanted, it created some problems. Um, so you see all kinds of ways that Germany is sort of pushed out and pushed to the edges. German citizens are made to register with the government and disclose their bank accounts. Laws, most notably the Espionage Act of 1917 and the Sedition Act of 1918, were passed making it illegal to criticize the government, the draft, or any aspect of the war. Can you imagine that? Think about, okay, so last night, President Trump ordered the, the use of Tomahawk missiles on Syria, right? There's all kinds of debate in the media today about whether that was a good decision or a bad decision or a somewhere in the middle decision. None of that debate would have been legal after the passage of these two laws, right? So think about that for a minute. Patriotic societies demonized Germany and all things German. Sauerkraut became liberty cabbage. Hamburgers became liberty sandwiches. Dachshunds became liberty pups. Orchestras stopped playing uh, German music, including Beethoven and Bach. Towns and streets were named, renamed. So Berlin, Iowa, renamed Lincoln, Iowa. You will not find Berlin, Iowa on the map anymore. Businesses were renamed. The German Savings Bank was renamed the Lincoln Savings Bank. Um, which is a common bank here in, in Iowa. Um, and in the state of Iowa, the legislature passed a law forbidding the use of German in any public forum, including churches, schools, and even on the telephone. It was called the Babel Proclamation from the, the Tower Babel. Right, and this is the environment in which, well, let me put it this way. This was successful. There was incredible support for the war. It is debatable whether things like the Babel Proclamation were particularly necessary. And in fact, if you go out to the Germans in Iowa exhibit that's out there, it talks specifically about this. Um, it's a really neat exhibit that was put together. Um, but with the loss of German culture in the United States as a result of this, um, this is the environment, by the way, that prohibition ends up being passed, the abolition of alcohol, because who are the beer companies? Anheuser-Busch, Pabst, Schlitz. These are German names. So it's not by accident that prohibition gets passed on a national level right on the tail end of World War I. But this is also why the Rutenbergs considered changing their name. Right? So it has effects. It has all kinds of effects. World War I has all kinds of effects on the big stage, which is, I think, sort of where we usually see it in, the, in, in school and in the big books and on the, the documentaries on the History Channel. But it had effects for people, like real people, like my grandparents type people, my great grandparents type people. Um, 
And I think that that's some of what these other talks are going to get at and part of what the exhibits you guys are going to look at also have to deal with. So with that, I will say I will take questions at the end. So next up.